I do. Are we ready? Um, yeah, we are recording. Okay. Live. Local. <laughs> Late breaking <laughs> podcast. <laughs> All right. Welcome to episode 27 of Brokers and Booze. I am Nick Sowers with Beach Connection Realty, and beside me is... Bill Yates with Sam's Realty. Yeah. Chris Ward with Eagle Realty. Yes. So today, we are going to try some wine. Nick, this wine, I do believe... It has a little story behind it. Part of a Gary Vee wine text. Yes, it is. Hashtag Gary Vee. So we were on the golf course locally here. Um, oh. Oh, hold up one second. Super locally. It's like right there. Yeah. yeah. We are like, yeah, <laughs> local, of course. But so we all, we all subscribe to Wine Text. So we get the text. So every day it's a deal of the day. But quickest way to spend your day. entire paycheck. Yeah. Winetext.com. Yeah. You're welcome here. So we were on the, so before the golf course, we're here. I get a text. It comes out at 12 every day, noon. They send you a deal. At 11, we get a text, and I'm actually going to read what it says because it really plays in our story with it. Nick's never been more excited about a wine text. It says, hello, everyone. We are giving you a one-hour warning today on today's wine. As you know, we never do this, but today's wine has the potential to be the single biggest offer in wine text history. And we anticipate a ton of disappointed customers because they missed out today. Today's Napa Valley Superstar is so shockingly priced that it will have you do a double take. You have one hour to send winetext.com links to your best wine friends or to share in your Facebook groups. They will love you for it. Good luck. So that comes out at 11 o'clock. We have a noon tea time or close to that. Maybe 11.50. 11.50. So we, we tee off and we're playing golf that day. And of course, we're all checking our phones come 12 because we have anticipation built for this wine text. We've doubled our handicaps. Yeah. So 12 o'clock comes and... No text. Then we're sitting there. We Next just keep, we keep playing golf. 12, 13, 12, 15 comes. We say we keep playing golf, but I remember yeah. taking my phone out to shots with me in the fairway yeah. and laying it down, <laughs> take the shot, put the phone back I up. That sure. to get definitely so happened. We didn't. That definitely <laughs> happened. So you are correct. So we were out there playing golf, playing 12, 15, 12, 30 comes. 12, 45 comes, no text. We're like, clearly they're having technical difficulties. So... Building the excitement, Nick. So better they're screwing with. I think game. at some point, Chris was it. I think I we both at some point on social media. Oh yeah, we called him out. We called out Gary B. Like it was about one thirty, almost two o'clock. Yeah, because it, it was past an hour after it was supposed to be out, hour and a half or so after everything was supposed to go out, and uh, so we started calling him out on social media, saying, "Where's this big text? They built up so much anticipation. They even you read that, but that, there was a day before." That yes. Gary B. I think did a post, or, or, or Wine Text did a post, like on Instagram or something. I remember seeing about the biggest wine deal going out the next day. So there's a lot of hype. So then I'm all of a sudden, so I'm like, I'll just start looking at some Facebook stuff, some Twitter stuff, and I see somebody on there said they replied to the hype text with the number of bottles they wanted. It, it sold out before the text got to you. And no, oh. no, they replied to it and they got it. Because the text never went out for right. this one. The text never went out for this one. So I saw it. So we're sitting there, the three of us, and we were playing with another friend of ours. And we're sitting there and we start talking about it like, well, if we do that, we don't know how much it costs. We don't know what we're buying. But the moment we put in the number of bottles we want, we're committed to buying it. It's getting charged to my, whoever's credit card. <laughs> so obviously they do a um, free shipping on 12. So naturally, we get twenty four. <laughs> <laughs> so we were like got twelve. So we were like twelve free shipping on a case, and we were like, we have no idea. This could be they could, it could be a three hundred dollar bottle of wine or something for a hundred bucks, and we just spent twelve hundred bucks. We had no idea. So we punch it in, and sure enough, the guy was right. You're all set for twelve of the David Arthur Mertaggio Red twenty fifteen. So, Total blind buy. Did so not know cost or type. It, it was nineteen eighty nine a bottle. Okay. And it retails for fifty one ninety nine. Yeah. So fifty five. Fifty five on here. So I got a deal. Oh, you yeah. got a deal on the Babino. <laughs> so <laughs> find it. So from fifty to sixty for nineteen dollars. Uh, we actually got it, and I'm, that was the most elusive, secretive thing to do. That's interesting. That the hype text you could reply to it. Like I almost wonder if that was intentional. 
Like, yeah. how do you set up the text to be able to reply and have the auto response to it? So we, That's odd. we, we, us three should probably yeah, make a decision. These as we're well, I'm going to say you built up the hype so much. I <laughs> yeah, let's say, I haven't tried it. For some, and I haven't tried this yet either. Have you tried it? I haven't. So, I haven't opened it. So put it on the wine shelf. What I'll tell you though about this, what I think we should do is anytime there's a hype text from now on, I think the three of us should just have it committed to going ahead and just play roll golf. the dice. Play like, golf. <laughs> no, just roll the dice. Just reply yeah. that it's hype text every time with the number of bottles we want. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, <laughs> hey. <laughs> I, no, I, I agree. Like, hey, so we can get free shipping. Come on, we're not idiots. So. If, if they're going to hype it, like mm-hmm. it's going to be. Um, it should be. A it good. should be good. I, we gotta trust. You gotta trust V a little bit and, and wine club. So what is? So it's a Mertaggio. What is? It's it's Mertaggio a twenty fifteen. It's like a red blend, isn't it? It's or blend mostly Cabernet Napa Valley. Petite Bedo in it as well. What's the? I can't ever say it. The Sangiovese. They said. I never can pronounce that one. Yeah. Do you know how to pronounce it? Sing it, just say it fast. <laughs> <laughs> say it slurred. Say it. Yeah. Sing like you got it fast. Maybe so, an Italian accent. They won't know if you're from the audience. Anyone know how to pronounce that? Sing your bass. Sing. Yeah. Sing movie. We're working on trying to get a live studio <laughs> audience exactly. for Burgers and Moose. <laughs> if anyone out there that's our fans are interested in come watching, I know there's a contact Bill Yates. <laughs> yeah. Well, the word you're trying to pronounce is actually <laughs> they say it's related to uh, the uh, Italian Tuscan. How you pronounce that? It's it's pronounced very differently than how it's spelled. But anyway, it's not like phonetic in its sound. Yeah. But they say it, it, it's an attribute to that with the cab uh, petit verdot blend that it is. 2015. Should we cheers? cheers. Should we try it? It has. We have not let it. You know, didn't breathe at all. I don't. I don't know. Let like it breathe. Here. Shattered. It shattered. Yeah. It's shattered. Yeah. Birthday gifts. That's really good. I like it. Yeah, if you spent nineteen dollars to get this wine, you are blessed. <laughs> like, dang, that's wow. not that's not your normal grocery store nineteen dollar buy right there. Yeah, no, it's not. And Chris is an expert in the grocery store. Right? I am an expert in the grocery <laughs> store. Better than the box. Yeah. Nice. What do you normally? You can't get even get a Chris? box. You can get a box for like ten no. now. You're a red wine. <laughs> yeah, get a box. That's my that quote's gonna be on Facebook. <laughs> I don't drink it. Yeah. <laughs> I just put it in my <laughs> fridge and like let it sit there. <laughs> so when my friends come over, I put, I put this in my glass. And I'm just joking. Yeah, I'm bad about this. <laughs> yeah, don't check after those bottles back. Yeah, let's <laughs> <like> mix. <laughs> He's refilling. He's refilling. Reporking. We really went down a path. Fantastic. Um, kind of like a black cherry. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Plum. What do they say about it? In 1989, they began producing a blend composed of, yeah. We're not allowed, Nick. It's not as, it's, so it's not as big as some of the reds that I think we've had on the show before. If you go back and watch some earlier episodes, we've had uh, some, some other reds, some very bold reds. Um, this is a little bit smoother. Uh, not For me, not as long on the palate. It doesn't really last um, as long as the back, but you can definitely pull the tans in. Um, on the front, yeah, decent tans. fruit on the front, but beautiful it's legs. smooth. White wine tech <laughs> said it, wine tech's called it beautiful spices, tobacco, and currants, full bodied, firm, silky with a tangy finish. I don't get the tobacco on the on, on the tongue, but the I get it on the front, I get it on the nose. I can smell that, yeah, you that can leathery smell tobacco mm-hmm. on the front. It did say it's a gorgeous wine to drink now or over the next few years. Well, let's just drink it now, so shall we? <laughs> 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 This is, this is nice. All right. Well, so I, I feel like we actually have a topic besides cool wine stories for you and winetext.com deals. I mean, our goal is to entertain, Chris. Okay. I'm sorry. I no. <laughs> so, yeah, we do. Have, okay. So here's our topic. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about um, real estate and going into summer, a lot of people vacation, whether they go to the mountains, the beach, whatever, and they stay in condos, they stay in houses, and everyone there inevitably has the thought when you're on vacation, wouldn't it be great to own something? Yes. Or own this, this, usually. If yes. you vacation in the right place, you say, yeah. yeah. Own this shit, <laughs> owning this building. Wouldn't it be awesome to own that? So today, we're, we're talking about investment properties, but we're specifically going to talk more along the line of vacation investment properties. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I would say one of the first things, if it's a non conformed building, you know where you're coming back to every year. Mm-hmm. You know what kind of, hopefully, condition, mattresses, things you things that you prefer because it's yours. You rent it out while you're not using it, and you get to make it yours when you come back to it. Yep. Okay. So I think just the knowing of taking out all the questionables is the okay. 
So specifically, Bill, because Bill, Bill actually sits in an oceanfront resort that has tourists in it constantly. And has, so you probably actually experienced this more than Chris and I, and it is, you have, a, you have a, somebody down on vacation, show them a unit or two. They like it. They like a unit, but they don't want to buy the one you showed them. Right. But there's other ones on the market that you can't get them into. What is what does that person need to do? Like, do you, have you ever sold one sight unseen? Sight unseen. Yeah, I do. In fact, that's kind of how June, July, and August typically operate, uh, with occupancy rates near 100. Mm-hmm. Um, I have Matterport where we can virtually walk through a floor plan and then kind of look at how it's furnished with decorative colors, mm-hmm. carpet versus tile, things of that nature. Um, and a lot of times, you know, if we can walk through a similar one that is available, but not the particular one that's for sale, they'll go ahead and trust me to do a walkthrough, uh, maybe a FaceTime with them by the time they get home. And, and I think they're ready to make the decision based on trust. So if they, let's let's go to the person that's not going the full trust. Oh, yeah. Because obviously the, there's investors out there that roll the dice and like, hey, Bill, if you say it's good, yeah. we'll write it up. You know. But... Let's go beyond that person. Okay, if somebody has the flexibility to come back and see it. Sure. Right. September. So do you recommend, or even come back later that summer, or come back, while it's under, do you recommend they go ahead and put the unit under contract and then come back and see it after they put it under contract? Or, sure. But do you feel a lot of people, are they hesitant to do that? Yeah, and numbers don't lie. So if you're showing them the potential revenues or the history of the revenues, obviously nothing's guaranteed. But um, showing the revenue stream, the expenses, you can gauge a, a cap rate or return on inve- investment, if you will. That's mostly what they're concerned about. Is it going to make money or at least break even? Mm-hmm. And if the condition is good, yeah. Let, okay, so if they're leaving next week and the guest doesn't check out for two weeks, yeah. go ahead and make a contingency on the offer to where I can come back on a set date, uh, approve the condition view, whatever your concerns are. And, um, do you recommend they stay decision. in that specific unit while it's a, while they have it under contract before they bought it? They could, but <laughs> honestly, they're going to sit there and they're going to pick <laughs> every cosmetic issue apart to where it's going to kill the deal anyhow. So unless it's new construction, and, and honestly, even new construction has defects. So mm-hmm. um, it just depends on if they're an engineer client or a, a school teacher client. <laughs> So sign and seems a little less about the property, more about the buyer that you're working Honestly, with. Honestly, yeah. The yeah. financial structure, the HOA, the direction of the resort, the condition of the unit, and um, the revenue stream. So. I know in rental management, we have, I say we typically have two to three types of owners of properties we manage. We have the strictly investor client. They hardly ever stay in the unit at all. I, I, and they're I've strictly there met for their time on investment. They call me on the and, phone. And they typically don't have to walk through the units as much. Yeah. They're more your sight unseen buyer a lot of times. Then you have the, what I call the person that's the, they want to come use it one or two weeks a year and, you know, break even on their investment or make a little money while they own something that they can go to at the beach. I feel like that's, and I feel like the third kind, the third kind of buyer is the, I hardly ever want to rent it. Very emotional. occasional. And I'm really picky on my stuff. And I'm really, I feel like those buyers are very much have to walk through the unit. They want the Tiffany lamps and they don't want anyone to touch it. Yeah. yeah. And we talked about that a couple episodes ago, those three types of, um, mm-hmm. of investment owners as far as that goes. But with, with sight and scene, not just in the vacation rental market, I think what our our state uh, with COVID and with this year and what's all happened in pushing the industry into kind of a different feel and in a different era, uh, if you will, like sight unseen, even with regular buyers has become a little bit more common uh, as far as not going into the unit, trusting video tours, walkthroughs, Agreed. Matterport, that kind of thing, using technology as well. But I do think it comes down to what are you using the, the property for? Is this mm-hmm. primary residence? Is this second yeah. home? Is this an investment property? Tricky. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to vary per each buyer. But I do, I've seen a climate shift in buyers of being more um, open that I don't need to physically be in there for three or four showings and like walk through their time and like nitpick everything. Uh, again, depending on the usage and what I'm using the property for. But I've been working with 
with, like you said, you know, I worked with a sight unseen for about 15 to 16 years. Like I can remember my first buyers that, that didn't need to see the unit and kind of trusted me and they were more investment buyers um, because yeah, they're looking, they're not looking at the property. They're looking at what does the property do for me, which is a very big difference. Right. And I try to really focus now on if a buyer, unless they're like a hardcore, what I call investor, where they're buying multiple units and it's just strictly about making money. If they're, even if they're the casual kind of investor that still might not stay in their unit, I tell them it, owning a property at the beach or owning a property in the mountains, it's, I mean, in the end, it's supposed to be fun. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what you're doing. People don't buy second homes for headaches. They buy it for fun. Mm-hmm. They buy investment properties at the beach for fun. Mm-hmm. So I, I try to really keep that focus on them, keep, keep them lighthearted, keep them from being too. Do you uh, buy uh, cruise line stocks for fun? Um, lately, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or is that a little too Sold them too. Did you? Sold them too. <laughs> no, no. Well, it goes, for me, it goes, and I think I've told this story before, um, but, you know, and you, this would speak more to you. You just asked Bill a lot of questions about from, from being on Oceanfront Resort and working with that, you know, that kind of oceanfront investor type buyer and, and units that probably range very similar as far as it, the only difference would be decor, like as far yeah, as, or, right. or maybe conditions. To say. And they got to trust you a little bit because if you're working with them from the rental side as well, then if the unit doesn't do well, you're not going to do well from a rental management right. side, us as well in rental management. So they got to have a little bit of trust with that. Then they but, call their agent on that. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but if you're the agent, I'm saying if you're on both sides, um, the, but you work obviously flips yeah. a lot of times. And I know I work with a lot of clients that buy long-term rental property. Yeah. And what I always have to remind them is, you know, you're not living here. Like yes. you are buying right. this property to, to rent to somebody else. So you're, taste necessarily, um, things that you are going to, you know, nitpick or pass on because it's hard for especially newer investment owners to take themselves out of the equation and not think like, if I lived here, this is what I want because that's not what's going to happen. You're not going to live there. If you, in my experience, flipping properties and then obviously the rental management, rental owning, if you try to make the property what you would live in, you will never make money in it. Mm. Because you will overspend, you will put in stuff that's going to be not the, what I call the value quality that can take the beating from a rain. Yeah, that can take the beating. You're going to put in the nicer carpet that's going to stain versus the carpet. People putting carpet in anymore? (laughs) Yeah, bedrooms. Yeah. Um, (laughs) color palettes. You know, I walked in condos where it's bright orange and you come to the beach to relax and no one can relax. So so something that's more applicable to everybody. Um, purple, purple, <laughs> <I'm sorry>. purple. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, how many? Because you, so I mean, but you bought how many properties sight unseen? How many properties have you actually been in in your flips? We probably flip forty to eighty, depending on the year. Properties a year. I probably actually walk in ten to fifteen of them okay. before we part to purchase. Right. Yeah. How do you get into those sentences? <laughs> uh, How do you get into Well, some of them were buying them off people that let us in. Yeah. Sometimes you, there is this trick you can do with a credit card. Yeah, right. I mean, and you can pop a lock open. It's not sanctioned. Um, if it's a vacant property, <laughs> I, can, I, I don't, don't do it, but I've seen <laughs> one of those foreclosure tricks. <laughs> yeah. foreclosure. I don't do it personally, but I've definitely seen You can hear the smoke alarm there. beeping. You're yeah. good. Yeah. 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 If you can hear that beeping. Oh, if they have... um. Phone books stacked up yeah. by the door. You know, there's probably From not somebody here. living in the property. Yeah. But the point being, that you don't <laughs> you don't need to go in because your purpose your purpose with the property mm-hmm. is is not based on what the property is about, but what you're going to do with the property. Yep. And usually, those properties you're buying at a discount from market value. Right. So you have some room to play there. If some you get in and there's something good, wrong. Good I, mean, yeah. I mean, we I mean we bought a property site unseen that we get in and it's um there's mold everywhere. I mean, literally, we should just strip it down to the suds and redo it. It's a little condo out here. Break even or any profits to be had? Um, we probably lost a little money, but figured it out. Um, yeah, we lost a little money, but we sold it. We actually stripped all the mold down, kills everything. Yeah. Never actually rehung drywall and sold it in that condition. <laughs> so. Gotcha. Which that's a unique buyer. Money. <laughs> that's a unique buyer itself because that's somebody that wants to win really rehung the property. Probably a tenant in there or. So what do you guys? Yeah, with t- no drywall and yeah. floors. Well, we know some people like that. <laughs> what do you? Because t- I know you're constantly setting up 
LLCs, mm-hmm. partnerships, setting up new for different property buys. What do we tell buyers? You know, I, I have that question every once in a while. I don't know the oceanfront investors you deal with if you have that a lot. You know, uh, as far as do I need to set up? Do I need to set up an LLC? Do I need to do this in a different you know company? You know, I'm not an accountant. I was advised talk with your accountant. Yeah, um, and your attorney. Yeah, and your attorney. Particularly if you're Canadian, you can save fifteen percent from the sales purchase on just sales tax alone. Mm. So shelter that tax um, yeah. with an LLC. In, in hindsight, it's gotta be a cash purchase. You can't have a, a mortgage, to my knowledge, in an LLC unless you personally guarantee it. But uh, it just depends on how you want to protect your liability there. So it's, it's never a bad thing to separate that from, you know, I had to get sued individually, they couldn't touch that ass. I actually had an attorney tell me, um, if you are, buying multiple if you go to a real conservative attorney they'll tell you every property needs to be its own LLC to protect you to be safe I had an attorney tell me listen here if you're an investor client if you're buying multiple properties you're going to five seven properties they said about every they put a dollar amount on it they said about every two to three million dollars worth of property then start a new LLC Hmm. they do it obviously if you have a separate LLC for every entity or for every property that's a separate tax return you're filing every year. Yeah. That's separate. I mean, you're you're, you're and and it's definitely adding them out of the umbrella. Significant expenses to it, um, rather than just tying a bunch of them up and then in one bubble them together. You are exposing some liability there, right. according to the attorney. Right. If you do pile them together, but that goes into another thing: buy the correct insurance for your properties. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Get the liability insurance. Get the property insurance. Get what you need. So, gotcha. So what's one thing you all would leave with uh, with investors as we because we're about to encounter you know umpteen of them as we go through the summer months? Call me. <laughs> that was not what I was going for. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, honestly, just be careful. Uh, make sure you trust your agent because there's a lot of agents out there that don't disclose things like the financial hardships of HOAs, the special assessments, the rules, regulations. Uh, so collect the minutes of the meetings the last few years, the, the last couple approved budgets, the future budgets. Just make sure if you can get a 15 to 20% reserve, that that would be great. Um, that's a healthy and that's what banks look for. Um, so ultimately just trust your agent because there, there's, there's some out there that know what they're doing. They can guide you. There's some that don't know what they're doing and, and you're just going to miss out on a lot of things. And, Bill, I think you said in a previous episode about like, and I know we've all discussed this, it's about know if your agent knows what they're doing. Like a guy that sells big land tracks might not know about buying or yeah, right. condos. Like make sure your agent you're working with has not yeah. the appropriate knowledge in what you're buying. I can uh-huh. tell uh, when I get an offer from agents that don't know what they're doing in a concrete and steel building, it's contingent upon a CL100, which is termite inspection. So... <laughs> <laughs> Your attorney would probably advise you not to not to have that expense. Does termites eat concrete? Um, I mean, the big ones in South Carolina. The murder, <laughs> the murder hornets <laughs> might. But, uh. my, I'll tell you, my last thing, uh, and I was on the podcast two weeks ago, and I mentioned this uh, little tidbit, and, and that's I, it's honestly just it's simple advice, but it's what I've told clients for years now, is just you really – predetermine what you're using the property for. Like we were just talking about with a long-term renter, they're going to long-term rent out, that's going to affect how you view it. If you're short-term or second home, or you, you're not really keen on renting, but you want to get a little bit of income, cover your HOAs, like determine that. Like know yeah. up front what that is, because that could determine a lot of what kind of property we're showing you, what kind of price range you want to spend, and you know what um, that usage of the property is important for you and your agent to understand to get the right property in the right situation. Certainly. Hmm. Good. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. I guess I'll just leave mine as what I already said. Make sure your agent knows what they're, yeah, what you're, what you're buying. And, and ultimately, in any profession, if you have an accountant, there's better accountants, there's worse accountants. Things that know tricks, attorneys are better than others. Real estate agents are better than others. So, and, oh, and I, I do tell them this, and I don't. There is a difference between a CPA and somebody that's a, just a paid tax preparer. Sure. When you start buying investment properties, go to a CPA. Yeah, yeah. Like certified don't, public. Yeah. So. Don't. Other really. than I've got my accounting degree and I've taken the county 101. <laughs> so, <laughs> so are we going to finish this bottle after we finish this episode? Well, we're definitely well, having another glass. In addition to that bottle, we've got two more. So we'll see you. We'll 
Stay classy. <laughs> no, don't we cheers first? Uh, we I think we that. cheers. Yeah. I'm going with Hills of Ice. Call me. Call me. <laughs> we'll be drinking. <laughs>